The fun thing about movies and media is that it can be interpreted through many different lenses that change how we take in the plot, the events, the characters. It gives us an opportunity to internalize art from different angles that unlock new forms of meaning unseen from other perspectives. I'd even argue that the best way to analyze art is through the synthesis of multiple different lenses of perspective. With that said, there's a phenomenon I've started to experience since becoming a leftist that becomes more obvious the more I rewatch old movies and shows that I enjoy. For example, while we know now that the Matrix series is a trans metaphor according to the co-director of the trilogy, some important scenes can be open for additional anti-capitalist interpretations. There's the famous red pill scene where Morpheus says, The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. That quote, which can certainly be interpreted through a gender-critical lens to explain how oppressive gender norms are in everyday society, can also be interpreted through a Marxian lens as being a commentary on how capitalism is just as prevalent as those pesky gender norms. When you go to work can simultaneously be about how you're pressured to present a certain gendered flavor of professionalism while on the job, but one could say it's also mentioned because it's one of the places where the oppression of capitalism is very prevalent. One can be a slave to both gender norms and capitalism. They're both prisons that we cannot taste or see or touch. Another example of a movie with multiple interpretations is the dystopian classic They Live. On the surface, it's a movie about an alien invasion where the twist is that the aliens are using humanity to serve their best interests. This isn't an uncommon plot trope, and the Twilight Zone episode To Serve Man is another example of it. However, getting back to the specific flavor of this trope that the movie They Live embodies, it can be argued from the Marxist perspective that the aliens are a metaphor for the ruling capitalist class, and that it's within the aliens' best interest to make sure that humanity is docile, making it easier to trick them into a system that exclusively benefits the aliens. What's really interesting about They Live is that the main gimmick of the movie, the glasses, can be seen as a meta-commentary on observational lenses when applied to the real world, not just media. Problematic fave, Slavoj Žižek, I already am eating from the trash can all the time. The name of this trash can is Ideology points this out in his documentary A Pervert's Guide to Ideology, where he focuses intently on the fighting scene in the movie and why the directors decided to dedicate a dramatically drawn-out display to the duel. He argues that the observational lens of anti-capitalism is so paramountly uncomfortable to wear because it exposes so many disturbing truths about everyday life. So, while it seems silly that Nada's friend is fighting so hard against wearing the glasses, it's because he's still in a state of what some would uncharitably call blissful ignorance and sees these glasses as a threat to that. This is certainly understandable, considering that the glasses make money say, I am your god, and advertisement media such as the television and billboards have continual mantras of consume, buy, and obey. This metaphor is so timeless that, like the battery metaphor in the Matrix movie, it's still used in modern media, with the most popular example being Green Day's music video for their song Back in the USA. This modern usage is evidence that the anti-capitalist interpretation of They Live was not made by mistake since modern artists have reused it to express their viewpoints in agreement with the original media. With these examples aside, we now get to The Twilight Zone, an eccentric series created by Rod Serling where every episode has its own novel plot. It's a series I personally enjoy, since the kind of fictional media I'm usually drawn to is concise. When I was in elementary, I read the entire Harry Potter and Hunger Games series, in part because it was a bragging right to have finished that amount of reading at such a young age. However, such fiction was very forgettable, and my interest in it dropped off a cliff after no longer needing to provide book reports for school. What was commercially popular within the genre disappointed me. It left me wanting. It wasn't until high school when I realized that short fiction was more of my speed, and I ended up watching Twilight Zone episodes on free periods and during my lunch break. It was more enticing and less exhausting to visit small worlds or scenarios through each episode instead of dedicating myself to a complex universe spanned over multiple books. Fast forward about a couple years after graduation, and I decided to watch through the episodes again since I found a higher resolution collection online. While I was able to enjoy them as much as I did back then, one episode struck me as more depressing than I first remembered. Season 1, Episode 30, A Stop at Willoughby. It's a simple enough plot. A man, fed up with his strenuous job, time travels to a peaceful town in the 19th century called Willoughby to escape his stressful life. 
When watching it again with the socialist lens I consume media with nowadays, I interpret this episode as being the evolution of a man's chronic distress with work, eventually leading him to fatalist escapism as a form of catharsis. That's quite the depressing change in perspective from a surface-level examination of the episode, so let's break it down. The episode starts out in a meeting where we are introduced to the main character, Gart Williams, and their work environment. Right away, you can tell that his boss fits the kind of caricature most anti-capitalists apply to the owning class. He's aggressive, fat, and is always seen smoking a big cigar. In the meeting scene, we discover that Gart has made a blunder that pisses off his boss, which leads him to reveal more behavior fit for an anti-capitalist caricature of a boss. He berates Gart with something that is clearly meant to make fun of meaningless corporate speak. This is a push business, Williams. A push, push, push business. Push and drive. A push, push, push business, Williams. It's push, push, push all the way, all the time. This repetitive drivel eventually gets to Gart, and he angrily tells his boss to shut up and retreats to his personal office. It is here where Rod Serling gives a telling bit of narration. This is Gart Williams, age 38. A man protected by a suit of armor, all held together by one bolt. Just a moment ago, someone removed the bolt, and Mr. Williams' protection fell away from him and left him a naked target. He's been cannonaded this afternoon by all the enemies of his life. His insecurity has shelled him. His sensitivity has straddled him with humiliation. His deep-rooted disquiet about his own worth has zeroed in on him, landed on target, and blown him apart. Mr. Gard Williams, ad agency exec, who in just a moment will move into the twilight zone in a desperate search for survival. Now, this quote makes me think a lot about workers whose experiences I've seen become degrading due to a similar effect. Their suit of armor, so to speak, is dismantled by quite the variety of things. If you search the subreddit r slash public freakout enough, you'll find plenty of service workers who are confronted by unruly customers, such as anti-maskers who make the job immensely more stressful, or angry Karens like this one that sometimes remove the proverbial bolt from a service worker's armor. Large. That is a large, man. No, this is a fucking small. We, we weigh it, man, like, like I, that's the most I can give you right now. We weigh it and it's all by weight and everything. You have fucking glasses on, which means you should be able to fucking see. That, and I want a large, ma'am. so make this shit correctly. Before I shove it down your damn throat. Yeah, I got you. I'm sorry. What the fuck is wrong with you? What the fuck? Get out. Get out. Get out. Enlarge. Get out. Open the door. Open the door. Hey, chill. Ma'am, what's up? I am the fucking manager, okay? I need you to get out. You're not even Ma'am. 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 Of course, this whole suit of armor metaphor isn't exclusive to service work either. Sometimes the threat can come from inside your job, just like the aforementioned scene in the episode, and I've experienced something similar to a lesser degree at my old job where higher-up coworkers would berate me in rude and unhelpful ways over how I got my work done, or the mistakes I would make due to being new there. Regardless of the way in which a worker's armor is broken down, Rod Serling's narration describes so well how work becomes stressful, how the worker is not respected in their profession, and breaks down due to stress. The episode continues on to a scene where Gart is riding the train home. When approached by someone working on the train who asks how he is, he exhaustively says, In the absolute pink. The two talk about winter for a bit, which leads Gart to say, Well, that's the way of the world. The rich get richer, and the days get shorter. While he doesn't say much during this tidbit, it's interesting because it portrays the ways in which one masquerades their suffering. In the pink is a phrase that means to be in good health and spirits, but the way in which Gart says it indicates that he is giving a comfortable response to a common question. It's like someone asking, how's it going, and replying, I'm good, or it's going. The actual question, especially in America, has lost its original meaning, which is to find out how someone is. And it's part of the daily drone of life, just like handshakes and minding your P's and Q's. People don't actually answer such a question honestly, because that creates an uncomfortable situation. As regards later comment, it's a variation of the saying, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, a common anti-capitalist phrase. One could also know that his variation where he says, and the days get shorter, is not just a comment on daylight time during winter, but also the way in which days feel when existing under the alienation of capitalism, that your free time is little, and that the agony of work feels constant, making days feel short and unfulfilling. After all this, Gart decides to take a nap on the train while waiting for his stop, and this scene becomes an important turning point in the episode. He has a dream where he wakes up on a train, but it's different. The train is empty and noticeably much older, with old-fashioned seats and window shutters. He opens the one next to his seat, and instead of it being a winter night, it's a summer afternoon. People are enjoying themselves, and relaxing music is playing in the background to set the scene. 
The conductor comes down the row and is saying this stop is Willoughby. Confused, Guard asks where he is and what Willoughby was. The conductor starts describing Willoughby, saying, Willoughby, sir? It's Willoughby right outside. Willoughby. July. Summer. It's 1888. Really a lovely little village. You ought to try it sometime. Peaceful. Restful. Where a man can slow down to a walk and live his life full measure. Guard hesitates to get off the train and soon wakes up from his nap due to a loud noise. This is the first of three instances in the episode of Gart's escapist daydreaming that make him flirt with the idea of an alternative and comfortable world to live in. This coping behavior, when not fatalist in nature, seems to be pretty normal for most people. It's not uncommon that I talk to friends of mine that are in the workforce who describe how they daydream about the other things that they could be doing instead of working, or the fantastical fun worlds that they could be in that contrast the boring one in which they're currently existing. Sometimes the comics and short stories we collectively fawn over work as templates for this sort of escapist daydreaming. Regardless, I happen to find a pattern in both others and myself that suggests that there's a connection between the alienation of capitalist work and a propensity for daydream-flavored escapism. Continuing on through the episode, Gart is now home, and his wife starts giving him a hard time about what happened at work, asking him if he's wrecked a career after badmouthing his boss. He says that it seems it hasn't, and sarcastically comments that his boss is founded in that great, oversized heart of his to forgive. The somewhat obese, gracious gentleman will allow me to continue in his employ because he's such a human type fella. The conversation keeps going, and Gart starts to vent about how he feels at his career. I'm tired, and I'm sick. Some people aren't built for competition, Janie. Or big pretentious houses they can't afford. Or rich communities they don't feel comfortable in. And you would prefer? I would prefer, though never asked before, a job, any job, any job at all where I could be myself. Where I wouldn't have to climb on a stage and go through a masquerade every morning at nine o'clock and mouth all the dialogue and play the executive and make believe I'm the bright young man who's on his way up because I'm not that person, Janie. You've tried to make me that person, but that isn't me. That isn't me at all. When his wife asks where he wants to be, Gart starts recounting Willoughby and how he wishes he were at a slower-paced place like that. In this scene, Gart's wife is a characterization of hustle culture. It's the fire under your ass in a capitalist society that sells you on the idea that a successful person has to be chasing things expensive, unfulfilling, and materialistic things. And to get there, you have to be productive, competitive, a go-getter, if you want the optimal life. The so-called American dream that presents itself as the sole and exclusive yellow brick road that everyone must follow to achieve happiness in this world. Gart's dialogue contests this dogma. It speaks for the people alienated by this culture of empty materialism and degrading rat races. It shows that he has an acceptance of his humanity. He accepts that not every person needs expensive niceties or work grind to be happy in life, which, mind you, is not an easy thing to admit in a system that would call such a person lazy or defective to disincentivize them from preferring a different vision of the optimal life that doesn't align the pockets of the rich. The episode soon cuts to Gart on the train again, going back to work. Once again, he dozes off while waiting for his stop and returns to the setting of his previous dream. He's back on the old train, the train worker remarking again that this stop was Willoughby. This time, Gart picks up his jacket and suitcase and leaves the train car to marvel at the scene for a while. During this hesitation to leave the train, it starts up again, and as he's yelling for the conductor to stop the train, he wakes up from the dream. He tells himself after waking, Willoughby, next time, next time I'm going to get off. This scene shows Gart's premeditation for suicide, since getting off the train is a metaphor for his transition from harmless to fatalist escapism. This scene shows the process one who contemplates fatalist escapism goes through. There's much hesitation, which is shown by Gart waiting on the old train, but never getting off since he has to weigh how big of a decision that is to make, despite the train conductor narrowing his window of opportunity to think about it. This second dream, along with the argument he had with his wife, makes Gart more comfortable with the thought of suicide. Even though he's already been pushed further into considering fatalism, the episode isn't done roughing up Gart just yet. The events of the episode move along to a scene where Gart is in his office. He's in a business call with his boss, who's again hurling push 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 and other mindless business speak at him about things like ambition and pizzazz for his next advertising project. He hangs up the call since he's fed up with it, but not long after, starts getting calls on multiple phones about something wrong with an advertising spot he was working on for a client. He calls for his assistant to get info for the clients, and the assistant lets him know that his boss wants to see him, most likely angry that he hung up during a business call. The stress of all this leads Gart to his office's bathroom, 
where the words of his boss play back in his head. Like the last scene where he was at work, all the built-up stress from his job leads him to break out again. This time, however, he punches the mirror in his bathroom. It's at this point that Gart makes a realization. He limps back to his office to make a desperate call to his wife. Fair warning, this scene is pretty disturbing, so if you want to skip it, here's a timestamp. Janie, there's a guard, honey. I'm coming home. Will you stay there? No, honey, listen, please. I've had it. Understand? I've had it. I, I just can't take this another day, not another hour. This is it right now. I, I, I've got to get out of here. Janie, will you help me, please? Will you please help me? Janie? While this scene doesn't feel eventful, it pertains to Gard's breaking point that makes it easier for him to choose fatalist escapism instead of simply considering it. Not only is he quitting his job, but he has no support group since his wife proved not to be dependable. Gard's abandonment of his wife's definition of success and the lifestyle that entailed led her to be apathetic to this traumatic point in his life since she interprets this behavior as failure and not the moment of deep realization that Gard's currently experiencing. By losing his most important connection to reality, not to mention his only source of support, his wife, Gart in this next scene starts to mentally decay. He's back on the train. The train worker, as usual, tries to talk with him, asking how he is. And Gart doesn't respond, just nods. He then takes a nap as usual, and has his third and last dream of the episode. The dream starts off like his last two, where he's on the old-fashioned train. This time, his facial expression brightens up at the mention of Willoughby. The conductor is at the exit door of the train and motions with his hand to beckon Gart to Willoughby. As he approaches, he picks up his suitcase like he did last time and, realizing how silly that is, leaves it on his seat, which makes the conductor smile. This time, Gart doesn't hesitate. He leaves the train. Right away, he starts interacting with the people there, talking with some kids about fishing, greeting the townsfolk, expressing how happy he is to finally be there. This goes on for a bit until there is a cutaway back to the train he was on before the dream. Gart is in a pile of snow and the train worker was explaining to someone that Gart jumped off the train, dying on impact when he fell. The Twilight Zone twist at this part is that the car that took him away was for a funeral parlor called Willoughby and Son. The episode then ends with some narration from Rod Serling to wrap things up. Willoughby, maybe it's wishful thinking nestled in a hidden part of a man's mind. Or maybe it's the last stop in the vast design of things. Or perhaps for a man like Mr. Gart Williams, who climbed on a world that went by too fast. It's a place around the bend where he could jump off. Willoughby, whatever it is, it comes with sunlight and serenity, and is a part of the Twilight Zone. So, let's break down this last part, and then I'll provide some external analysis on this all. Firstly, Gart starts off this scene being unresponsive to the train worker he usually talks with. This is a red flag since he doesn't even have the mental capacity to give the worker a bullshit response this time around. As for the dream, he finally succeeds in his dedication to fatalist escapism. The show pays a good bit of attention to Gart leaving his suitcase on the train as it's symbolic of him leaving his life behind, symbolic of dying. I wouldn't consider it a stretch to say that Gart's dream was a metaphor for suicide, considering Rod Serling's ending narration hints to this by calling Willoughby a last stop in the vast design of things which is the kind of description one would usually reserve for concepts like death or the afterlife. This is not to say that death has to be a necessary or even acceptable outcome in situations that tend to point in the direction of fatalist escapism. I doubt that usual therapeutic mechanisms such as mindfulness or meditation would have helped fix the problems he was experiencing since they were chronic and systemic in nature, but some kind of social intervention before his death could have saved his life. Perhaps his assistant could have stopped him to chat for a while before he erratically left work, Maybe if the train worker was more attentive, he could have inquired as to why Gart wasn't as talkative that day. I mention these possibilities because I want to remind you that the unfortunate conclusion Gart fell victim to doesn't need to be an inevitability, and people need to know that small acts of kindness can genuinely save a person's whole ass Willoughby enjoying life. You as a viewer might still be left wondering why the hell I decided to analyze a show from the 1960s to explain its underlying messages about worker burnout, anti-capitalism, and suicide. Why, out of all things, did I decide to do this for a video? It's because this message is powerful, and it's still prevalent even today, over 60 years later. In modern media, there's a lot of representation of mental illness, especially depression. The problem I always had, especially when I was at my old job, is that these depictions never really felt like my flavor of depression. 
Sure, I can sometimes relate with the dissociations that May experiences in A Night in the Woods, or the self-harm that Philosophy Tube describes in her video Suicide and Mental Health, but it didn't feel like my depression, you know? It wasn't until watching a stop at Willoughby where I felt that the depression being represented was a bit more like what I felt. I was miserable at my last job. It was mentally exhausting since I did mostly the same stuff, the same paperwork, every day. I had so little time and energy to myself when I clocked out that it just felt like a pile of wasted space when I got home. I wanted to get out. I didn't care about the grind mentality. I didn't care about achieving more. I didn't sign up for overtime or weekends. I just wanted to live slow and enjoy life. If you do a little searching, there are many more like me in this regard. In online communities, especially r slash anti-work, it's a common occurrence that people post about wanting to or finally quitting their job. Usually the post is made there, sometimes obviously so, because they want to be comforted for making this decision. They're having the same kind of moment that Gart had when he'd finally had it. Although, instead of phoning their wife, they post on Reddit. They all made similar realizations to Gart, that the American dream is a lie, and that not everyone should have to overwork themselves to have a nice life, and that a nice life isn't about expensive garbage. They're tired of modern consumerism, and just want to slow down and appreciate life. A similar point is made in an essay I narrated by David Kane called Your Lifestyle Has Already Been Designed. In short, he explains that capitalists have shifted our lives from cheap, fulfilling, and long activities to short, expensive, and unfulfilling ones, the kind that they've taught us to chase through overworking ourselves and being miserable. A stop at Willoughby is a characterization of this phenomenon, and Gart was the demonstration. With that said, a stop at Willoughby wasn't just some small meaningless episode out of the over 150 in Twilight Zone's catalog. Allegedly, it was Rod Serling's favorite season 1 episode, and the original script was considered for use as the pilot episode, but my guess is that it was too dark and depressing for an opener. I don't find it a coincidence that the episode was made the way it was, or that Rod Serling liked it so much. He was a rather progressive man for his time, considering that his experiences as a veteran shaped his anti-war views, and his later forays into politics led him to make works and comments in favor of racial equality and against rugged individualism. This was the 1960s, mind you, so that was some relatively far-left stuff for the time. There is a heart of down-to-earth, pro-average show progressivism in creative media that still beats on to this day, and while the culture war still rages on, albeit with different levels of intensity over the years, you cannot silence what is true about the world, and the expression of the pain of unfairness, the fulfillment of fighting it, the hope of utopia over the horizon.